about Fire Smart Landscaping. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth and let her introduce herself and get started. All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, like she said, my name's Elizabeth Ekstrom. I'm an extension educator located at the Hall County Extension Office. And today we're gonna talk about Fire Smart Landscaping. Um, so what is Fire Smart Landscaping? Well, Fire Smart Landscaping is strategically um, planting plants to resist the spread of fire um, to your home or to your residence. Now, why is it important? Well, um, we have several reasons why. So if you remember back in 2022, we had the fire that went through um, West Central Nebraska, um, took out the um, fire tower located at the Halsey National Forest. Um, you know, in 2023, we were looking uh, dim for our fire, uh, wildfire year. Um, also, if you remember, we had three Nebraska fires that continue to burn in eastern Nebraska a little bit later in 2023. Then we take a look at 2024. Lincoln and Custer County fires um, continued to spread. And at one point in time, there was over 70,000 acres that were burned um, and several residences. So this is why we're talking about fire smart landscapes today. So there are three factors that determine that wildfire behavior. The first is gonna be fuels. So the things that are going to burn and allow that fire to continue. The next is gonna be weather. Are we windy? Are we dry? Is there rain? Um, and then lastly, it's gonna be topography. Are there hills, valleys, um, things along those lines? So the only aspect of those three that we can impact is fuel. And so um, what we can do then is to create a fire smart landscape. So the first way to create a fire smart landscape is to um, go ahead and create a defensible space. We'll talk more about what those defensible spaces zones are, um, but also we're talking planning and we're talking that management as well. Um, that is also very important um, when we're talking about the fire smart landscape. Um, next, when we're talking about that planning, we are looking at those three zones of the defensible space. So zone zero, zone one, and zone two. There are several different fire smart or fire wise curriculums that are out there on the market. Um, they're all pretty much the same. The only difference between a couple of them are is zone zero in some curriculums is zone one or zone one is sometimes zone two. Uh, but they're all the, the same when it comes to what are the um, aspects of that. So zone zero is in, immediately right next to the, to the residence. And zone one is right next to that. And zone three is from there out to the property line. Now, zone zero is known as the ember resistant zone. This is at zero to five feet immediately right by the residence or right by the house. And so that's the thing that we need to keep in mind is when we're looking at these different curriculums for fire smart landscapes, again, these are things that we can implement to decrease the risks of a fire starting or igniting from blowing embers in that area. Now, are all of these going to be landscape practices that we're going to implement? Probably not. But if we have a residence where it's out in the country, or maybe it's surrounding a lake where we're not there all the time, these are some good things to keep in mind, especially um, if wildfire is a possibility in that area. The objective of the ember resistant zone right next to the house is to create that most fire resistant zone. We don't want embers to blow in and ignite and then start the residence on fire. So the greatest hazard in this zone is those plants that are planted right up next to the house, near the doors, near the windows. And so what we need to keep in mind with this zone is if we're installing a fire smart landscape, we wanna use sparsely planted plants. That way, in case if they were to um, catch on fire from blowing embers, it's not going to spread throughout the landscape right next to the home. We wanna make sure that these plants are low growing 
non-woody, and mainly herbaceous plants that are less than 18 inches tall. Now, again, we talked about these curriculum, curriculums are for fire smart landscapes. They may not be what we consider aesthetically pleasing landscapes. But again, for fire wise or fire smart landscapes, these are the recommendations. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is if we're using materials, whether it be something for mulch or something as a walkway, um, we're going to utilize those non combustible materials like concrete, brick pavers, gravel not wood mulch. Um, this zone, zero to five feet in that ember resistant zone, we're gonna avoid using the wood mulches in this area. We're also going to avoid climbing plants. Um, we wanna make sure we have clearance around the chimney within 10 feet, so we don't want any branches um, to be against the chimney. We also wanna make sure that we get rid of any leaf litter or other litter that might be in the gutters. Again, for the fact of blowing embers, lands in the gutter on those leaves, um, it's going to ignite. Now, some of us, like myself, like to store items under my deck. Um, that way it's out of the way. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind is sometimes these items can also be combustible and we're putting that fuel source very close to the house. So if we have those combustible items, we wanna make sure we remove them from under the deck. That includes any leaf litter that might be under there or any of those other stored items that might be combustible. Now also in that zero to five feet, um, ideally for fire smart landscapes, we wanna remove any of those flammable containers, um, mulch, fencing, furniture, things along those lines. Um, sometimes that's not always doable. Um, I'm not going to walk at least 10 feet out to put my trash in the trash can. Um, but like I said, if we know that we're in fire season and there's a high possibility for fires, we want to follow some of these rules. We also want to make sure these combustible landscape items um, are not attached to the house, like our arbors, our trellises, things like that. And also we want to make sure that we follow good management. Now, next to zone zero, which is the ember resistant zone, we have zone one. Zone one is the lean, clean, and green zone. Um, this zone is that five feet to 30 feet away from the home. Um, what we wanna do in this zone is to reduce the heat and movement of a flame um, by creating a lean and green zone. Um, we want to make sure that we're using those low growing plants again. We also wanna make sure that those plants are well irrigated. Also, for our walkways, we wanna make sure we're using those non-combustible materials again, like our pavers or our walk or our concrete or things along those lines. And then also in this zone, we can utilize that wood mulch, but we need to make sure we're not doing vast expanses of wood mulch. With this zone, we can break up those mulch areas into like mulch pools or planting beds that utilize the mulch. That way, in case if an ember was to get into that, it's not going to spread rapidly from mulch to mulch to mulch. It's gonna have a more difficult time if we do those mulch beds. Now, we wanna make sure that um, we move that firewood, that lumber, and we also move any other of those combustible items out of that zone one. So we wanna make sure that these items are at least 30 feet away from the house. We also want to make sure that we utilize that ample planting space. And again, it comes down to if one plant was to start on fire, is it going to spread throughout the other plants very rapidly? And then management in this zone is going to be critical. We want to make sure we remove any dead branches or dead trees. Um, we want to make sure that the plant material that we're using in this site is well watered, drought tolerant, tough as nails plant. So those are things that we need to consider in this zone one. The next zone is going to be that zone two. This is called the reduced fuel zone. This is gonna be that 30 feet away from the residence to 100 feet or to the property line, whichever comes first. The objective of this zone is to decrease the energy and speed of the fire by eliminating that continuous dense vegetation. And we're gonna do that both vertically and horizontally. Um, sometimes this is often the transition zone 
between those managed areas and those fringe areas farther away from the house. In this zone, we're going to plant and use those different plants. And the thing to keep in mind is if we're looking 100 feet or to the property line, these plants that are farthest away from the house might not need to be irrigated once they're established. So we wanna make sure we're utilizing those drought tolerant hardy plants because they might not be irrigated. If we're going to be utilizing mulch in this area, um, we can go ahead and do so. So there's no, not as many regulations in this zone two when it comes to using our combustible mulches. Um, we also wanna allow for the ample plant spacing again. And depending on where we're located at, we might need to work with our neighbors. You know, do we have a turnaround spot where if a fire truck has to come, it's able to turn around very quickly and very easily? Um, is there access like between our properties that if a fire truck has to go in there um, or a fire rig has to go in there that they have that access? You know, do we have one of those um, welcome signs that's a big post and, and, a, and a cover over the top where it could limit if a fire truck can go down the lane or not? So in this zone, we also want to consider and work with our neighbors. Now, our fire smart guidelines for spacing plants really um, depend not only on the plant material that we're using, but it also makes a difference on our um, slope that we have. So we're talking vertical spacing, and oftentimes we don't discuss that when we're talking plant material. Um, a lot of times we like to layer our plant material and we wanna put the overstory trees and the shrubs underneath it and then the smaller plants. Um, in this um, fire smart landscaping, we want to make sure we provide vertical spacing. Um, so we're going to try to avoid planting those shrubs underneath those taller trees. Um, and the reason for that is um, those shrubs, if they were to ignite, they would start on fire and then the fire would move up the shrub to the tree, to the next tree and kind of um, turn into a fire ladder. And then when the fire jumps from canopy to canopy, it can do so very quickly and it can be very difficult um, to put out. And so that's where we're gonna make sure that we provide that vertical spacing um, between our plant material. We also wanna make sure we leave adequate spacing between our planting groups. And again, reason for that is if one was to start on fire, we don't want it to move to another planting group very easily. We wanna make sure we leave adequate room between them so that way we're not jumping between those planting groups. And then we wanna make sure that we avoid planting in rows or hedges unless we're talking a windbreak. Windbreaks are one of those that we want to plant in rows or hedges, um, but we're talking for those plants that are gonna be in the landscape um, as more of an ornamental um, type of a plant. So we want to avoid planting in rows or hedges. Again, if a fire was to start on one end of that um, row, it's going to move very rapidly throughout the row. So that's the thinking behind that. Now, when we're talking about the guidelines for spacing, um, these are gonna be for those landscape plants, those landscape trees. So we want to make sure with those landscape trees, especially those evergreens, that we're going to remove those lower limbs about six to 10 feet off the ground, unless they're a windbreak. Again, we want that windbreak to go all the way to the ground. That's what windbreaks do is they're going to stop the winds, stop the snow, things along those lines. But when we're talking those landscape plants, those landscape trees, we can limb them up to six to 10 feet or if they're younger or smaller trees, we're gonna follow the two thirds rule where we're gonna have two thirds canopy to one third trunk. And then with time, what you can do is you can slowly limb up those smaller trees until you get to that six to 10 foot mark. Um, but we really want to avoid mass planting those shrubs at the base of the tree so we can prevent that fire ladder that can sometimes come in. If we look at the table, what we're seeing on the table is we are looking at that recommended defensible space distance. And what this just tells us is when we have a slope, we need to increase the distance between our plant material. 
So if we have a very um, gently sloping landscape, zero to 20% slope, um, you know, shrubs and woodlands and trees, we want to make sure we have 100 feet between these aspects. Because what can happen is we can see that fire move from tree to tree or from shrubbing, shrub planting to shrub planting. Um, so we need to have at least 100 feet. Now look what happens when we increase our slope. When we increase our slope, then we need to increase the distance between those plant material, that plant material. So, you know, when we had a gentle slope, we needed a hundred feet. But when we have moderate or very steep slopes, then we're increasing that distance to closer to 200 feet. Because when we think of a slope, it's fire is going to move up more rapidly on a slope. So that's one thing we need to consider is it's not just the distance between the plant material, but we also have to take into consideration that slope that's in the landscape as well. Now, when we're talking about those common garden hazards, some of the common garden hazards that are gonna be on a residence could be wood piles, uh, lumber piles, gas generators, and propane tanks. So if we're managing a fire smart landscape, we need to make sure that these items are kept at least 30 feet away from any structure and 10 feet away from any plants. And again, we don't want these to act as a fuel source to ignite the plant material and have it spread throughout the landscape. Other common garden hazards are gonna be anything combustible. So, you know, that's gonna be our patio furniture our plastic garbage bins. And then one of the ones that often gets forgotten about is the doormat, because sometimes those core doormats or those rubber doormats are extremely flammable. They're right up close to the door. We have an ember that flies in, lands on that and starts the fire. So if wildfire is approaching, or if we're in a red flag warning, or you're in an area that's extremely dry, these are some things to keep in mind because that patio furniture can, can ignite very rapidly and very quickly. We want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to decrease those chances of those embers taking hold. Now, plant selection is something um, that we can consider. So the thing to keep in mind with plant selection and a fire smart landscape is all plants are going to burn. The big question that we have with this plant material is it is more important to consider where a plant is placed, how it is managed to make sure that we are not um, creating a fire hazard. So first and foremost is select that right plant for the right place um, and make sure it matches the landscape aesthetic of your client as well as we manage it properly. So when we take a look at those plant characteristics, um, some of the things that we need to consider for a fire smart landscape is going to be, does that plant contain a lot of waxes, oils, or resin? Um, what's the growth habit of that plant material? Is it open? Is it dense? Is it short and compact? How does that plant grow? How fast does that plant grow? Does it have rapid growth? Is it a slow grower? What, what is its growth habit? How tall will it get? And then we also need to consider, does that plant have uh, bark that will shed or ornamental bark? Um, because depending on where that plant is located at, some of these factors can make a big difference when it comes to the flammability of these plants. So when we're taking a look at that plant selection, all of these aspects are going to increase the flammability of that plant material. If it's high in resins or oils, if that plant material has a low moisture content with open growth form, um, and if it has fine twiggy stems, and then also if it contains a lot of dead or dried plant material with loose or papery bark. So in the picture, what we have is a hedge of arborvitae. So when we take a look at that arborvitae, we can tell that they are not healthy. Uh, in fact, they are dead. Drought got them. But anyway, 
what would happen if an ember was to land on one of those arborvitae? We are ticking off many of the boxes when we're looking at that arborvitae. High in resin content, low moisture content, tall growth habit with fine twiggy stems that contains a lot of dead plant material. So if an ember was to land on that, it's going to spread very rapidly because that plant has some of the um, characteristics that make them very flammable and we're planted in a hedge. So, you know, those are some things to consider when we're talking about plant selection. Now, on the other hand, when we're talking about plant selection that decreases flammability, we're looking at that plant material that's gonna have a low oil or resin content, a high moisture content, Maybe it's gonna contain some soaps or latex or contain some pectins. A compact growth form, it's gonna have green stems and it's gonna be drought tolerant. So the plant that I have as an example for this is gonna be the yucca. If you've ever tried to kill yucca, it's extremely difficult. If you've ever tried to control yucca with fire, it's extremely difficult to control. So that's one of the plant materials that we need to keep in mind. Now, fire resistant plants are those that do not readily ignite from a, from, from a flame, but they can still burn. We talked about all plants are gonna burn, but those are more fire resistant are not going to readily ignite. So those fire resistant plants are usually gonna be those that have supple leaves, they're gonna have little dead wood or dried material in it. And like we talked about previously, that sap is gonna be water-like and have a very low resin content. There's several different plant materials that will meet these requirements or these recommendations for fire resistant plants. So when we're talking about these ground covers, we're talking about things like turf, checks all the boxes, it's green, it's drought resistant. It doesn't have very much dead material in it. Um, we're also talking sedum. So think about sedum. Leaves are fleshy, very drought tolerant, um, does extremely well, is hardy. Uh, snow in summer, ice plant, creeping flocks, all of these are ground covers to consider, especially in that zone zero when we're talking those low growing plants that are under 18 inches tall, that are gonna be non-woody and herbaceous. All of these are gonna check the boxes. Also, some of these ground covers are going to check those boxes as well. So pussy toes, if you've never seen it, very uh, fine hairs covered white. Um, it's got a whitish cast to it, which means it's usually going to be drought resistant. Um, we're gonna have uh, some of our shaded areas are gonna do dead nettles and pachysandra very well. Um, more of our sunny areas, we're going to have the speed well, the creeping thyme, and the dianthus. Again, all of these are great considerations in that zone zero, within zero to five feet from the, from the residents. Next, we're going to go out to our perennials. So these are going to be those that are going to be um, usually going to be taller. Um, these are going to be, again, some of them are going to be 18 inches or smaller. Some of them are going to be a little bit taller. All of them are going to be hardy for Nebraska. So yarrow, again, one of those has a whitish cast to it. Um, lots of really good drought tolerant, different cultivars to it. Um, believe it or not, chives. Chives is one of those where if you want it to spread, it could spread by seeds. Um, very tough to kill, does very well, um, and it's edible. So, you know, two for one on that one. Um, if we're talking those shaded environments, columbine does very well. Um, carrots or sedges is another one that can handle some of those shaded environments, does very well. Um, partially shade, we can do the virginia or the pig squeak. Um, big leaves on it, super glossy. Um, think about how those characteristics are going to contribute to it being um, utilized in a fire smart landscape. And then we're talking the tried and true, hardy, echinacea, coreopsis, delphinium. All of those are going to do very well in a landscape. Next, we have some of our other plant material. So Gallardia, blanket flower, um, short-lived perennial, um, does very well. 
um, hardy cranesbill or the hardy geranium. Nice mounded form, um, hardy, um, does extremely well. Now I used to refer to daylilies as the atomic bomb plant because I feel like they could survive an atomic bomb. Daylilies I feel like can handle a wide range of um, growing conditions. Earlier this spring, somebody referred to them as the cockroach of plants um, because they multiply very readily and they're found everywhere. So you can decide what you wanna call daylilies, um, but I feel like they're a very hardy plant. They do very well in a lot of different um, locations. If we're talking those plants that might be in the shade, um, we're talking corovels and hostas, um, and then we're gonna go with those sun lovers, those iris, they do extremely well. Uh, the Missouri primrose, like what's in the picture, does extremely well and is very hardy, low growing, drought tolerant. And then also um, our penstemons are another good one. Prairie coneflower, um, the, these are gonna be like the upright prairie coneflowers like the retibita, um, it's going to be the Mexican hat. Some of those other um, prairie coneflowers are going to do very well. Now, lamb's ear is one of those that it can seed itself, it can spread, very drought tolerant, very hardy, um, covered in fine white fur. Um, salvias are tough. Uh, we talked about yucca. Yucca is tough. Um, you know, you either love it or you hate it as a landscape plant, um, but it is one that is extremely tough. Again, Russian sage also falls into that same category. You either love it or you hate it. Um, it is a really great plant for attracting pollinators. It's tough, it comes back year after year, minimal amount of effort. And then the blue mist spirea, the caryopteris, again, another plant does very well, suffrutescent, so you can whack it back to the ground in the spring, um, very nice plant. Now, the thing to keep in mind is most of our deciduous shrubs are going to be fire resistant. Um, and there's a lot of different shrubs to consider. So you can consider like lilac, um, sometimes your current, uh, sumac, again, um, lots of different kinds of sumac, whether it's the brolo sumac, the skunk sumac, smooth sumac, um, they all can kind of spread. So you have to kind of be aware of where you put them. Then we're talking those willows. And then the cotoneaster is another one that can do um, okay. Um, just understand with the hedge cotoneaster, sometimes we can have some fire blight issues with that one. Mahonia, um, this is one that can handle that um, part shaded, kind of shaded environment. Um, it is the holly for us that can't grow holly out west. Um, has this similar uh, leaf shape um, to holly and um, it's an evergreen um, kind of a shrub. So it does very well. One of the shrubs that I feel like doesn't get enough um, credit is going to be that service berry. Um, it's also known as the June berry. It blooms around Memorial Day. It produces these edible berries like you're seeing on the screen. Um, and then it can have good fall color. So I mean, multiple seasons of interest when we're talking this large shrub, small tree. Um, again, with the dogwoods, uh, another one, really tough, hardy plant um, that we can utilize in these fire smart landscapes. Other shrubs that do very well, uh, burning bush, one that we often forget about is that mock orange with that spring bloom. Um, for those of us that might have a little bit of a sandier site, uh, sand cherry is one of the ones to consider. There's Pawnee Buttes, which is a shorter one. Um, it's very, um, very pretty in the spring. It produces lots of little tiny white flowers. Rose, uh, spirea, I mean, pick a spirea, pick a size. Um, we can find a spirea that will do well in most locations. Snowberry, um, also known as buck brush to some of us. Again, produces these white berries on it, um, does very well. Lots of different kinds of viburnums. Um, there's viburnums with blueberries, there's viburnums with red berries, there's viburnums that like um, these somewhat shaded conditions, there's viburnums that'll do well in more sun locations. So, I mean, there's lots of viburnums to pick from. And then one of our natives, um, especially in like that zone two, where it might be away from the house, further away, is going to be that choke cherry. I mean, glossy leaves, 
white blooms followed by edible sour fruit that you have to add a lot of sugar to. Um, but it is a, a, a good plant that will form a nice large shrub. Now, when we're talking these trees, we didn't see a lot of evergreen trees on the market. Reason for that is a lot of our evergreens are going to have a lot of resin or oil content. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these um, trees we already know starting off are not a fire smart kind of a tree. So keep that in mind. Try to keep those evergreen trees away from the house, especially in zone zero immediately night next to the house. But I mean, in terms of our trees, we have so many options. Um, you know, we have hackberry, we have crab apple, um, can't go wrong with an oak, uh, catalpa, great in zone two, far away from the house where you can enjoy the white flowers, the large leaves and the bean pods and not have to pick them up. Now, birch is one of those that you have to kind of um, use a little bit further out, zone one, zone two. And the reason for that is, you know, if we're talking a river birch, we think about what the bark does. That bark is going to be that exfoliating bark. In a fire smart landscape, we need to be aware of that because that exfoliating bark can be um, an ignition source. And then hawthorn. So when we're talking those evergreen trees up next to the house, we talk about limbing them up. And again, that's mainly for that fire smart um, landscaping. Um, we have a few other trees to consider. So one of them is that Kentucky coffee tree. Um, yes, it can produce big bean pods with huge beans inside. Uh, but in, if you get the male cultivar, you don't have to worry about that. Or if you stick it out in zone two where it's a little further away from the house, um, you won't have to worry about that either. Honey locust, they're a tough tree. I mean, you get thornless and you get podless and you let it do its thing. Sweet gum. Um, is another good one. Walnuts um, are a tough one. You have to be kind of wary if you do a black walnut because um, it produces juglone, which can inhibit plant growth, especially garden plants. Um, so kind of be wary where you put that. Aspen is a good one. Um, there's prairie gold aspen that doesn't sucker as much, but if you don't care if it suckers, um, just kind of put it off on the edge of the landscape and let it do its thing. And then lastly, if you have the room, Let's consider that sycamore. Huge leaves, tall overstory tree, um, does very well. Now, um, management of a fire smart landscape is just as important as the plant selection that we use because the goal is to reduce the amount of fuel. So if we're managing these plants correctly, we're removing that dead, dried plant material, we're removing those dead leaves, um, we're removing any of that combustible material. Um, and then also when we're using this equipment, we wanna make sure we're using the equipment properly to avoid sparks. We wanna make sure that we're doing everything that we can so we're not starting um, those, those ignition sources. We wanna make sure that we routinely remove and dispose that overgrown plant material. And then each fire season, we want to reevaluate that property. Now in Nebraska, our wildfire season ranges from early summer through um, mid autumn. However, um, in recent years, we've seen it starting whenever those conditions are right. So just because it might not be in fire season, doesn't mean that risk isn't there. So some fire smart strategies when it comes to plant material is making sure that those plants are well hydrated. We also need to make sure that our irrigation systems are in good condition and we wanna make sure we make those repairs um, that are necessary. And then maybe if we're in an area where fire might be an issue, um, we might just wanna store an extra hose with those emergency supplies. Just in case the fire, um, fire crews need to come out and they need to refill. Or maybe somebody needs to go out and kind of spray down the landscape to make sure that, that those embers are not going to land in a dry spot. Now mulch is one of those, depending on what zone you are in, there are different recommendations. Um, so non-combustible mulches pose no fire risk and they can help to deflect a fire. 
So that is why the recommendation is to use those non-combustible mulches up in zone zero right next to the home because they could um, deflect the fire. Now, when we're talking about those wood chips, we're talking about those composted wood chips are the least hazardous organic mulch that we can use. And again, in zone one, we're gonna utilize those in mulch um, in smaller beds. But when we get out to zone two, we can use them more readily. The most hazardous mulches include shredded rubber, because if they are to ignite, they're gonna sit there and they're gonna smolder and they're gonna burn for an extended period of time. Pine needles and shredded cedar can ignite very quickly um, and burn very rapidly. So if we're selecting mulches for these areas, we need to keep that in mind. So again, these are just some of the recommendations for the different zones. Um, zone zero is non-combustibles. Um, zone one, we can use some of the composted wood chips or the bark nuggets. We're going to have uh, areas or beds that are kind of spread out. We don't wanna have continuous mulch beds. And then when we get to the zone two, pretty much we can use whatever mulch we wanna use um, because it's going to be farther away from the residents that we're not going to have to be as concerned about that. Now, when we're talking about pruning, we wanna make sure that we're cutting back that woody or twiggy overgrown shrubs. We wanna make sure that we're utilizing and managing those plants so that way we're not creating a fire risk. We wanna make sure that we cut back those vines and ground covers, especially those ground covers that will catch the dead leaves and trash um, because we don't want those to sit there and act as a, as a fire hazard or a fire risk. And then lastly, um, we're gonna remove those dead damaged or diseased branches. Um, we wanna make sure that they are removed from the landscape. They're not doing any good to the plant material. And then also we wanna make sure we remove them so they are not a fire risk. We talked about limbing those trees up um, to six to 10 feet off the ground as long as they're not a windbreak um, because we wanna make sure that we're decreasing those fire risks as much as possible. Now, when we send out um, an uh, email or the handouts that you got today, um, you'll see a defensible space activity that's in there. It's a two-page document. It looks very similar to what is on um, the screen right now. But what it does is it gives you ideas on things you can do in each one of these zones to decrease those fire risks and to implement a fire smart landscape. So, you know, in zone zero, some of the examples that we talked about is using the hardscapes, um, removing all the dead and dying weeds and branches, um, limiting those combustible items, relocating that firewood, uh, relocating garbage cans and things like that. Now, when we're looking at that zone one, again, removing those dead plants, removing those dried leaves, removing those branches away from the roof, and then um, relocating those wood piles, uh, making sure that they are outside of that zone one. We wanna get them into that zone two. And then also we wanna create separation between trees and shrubs um, that could catch fire. And then we also um, wanna consider in that zone two um, to cut or mow that grass to make sure that it's not acting as a fire hazard. Um, we wanna make sure those wood piles are 10 feet away from any plant material and 30 feet away from the house. Create those horizontal spacing between um, trees and shrubs. And again, it depends on what your um, slope is, what the distance should be. And then remove any fallen leaves, um, needles and twigs. Now in the all zones, um, some of the recommendations that they have for this is to mow before 10 a.m. Um, and again, the reason for this recommendation is the grass is gonna be damp during that time. If you were to hit a rock to cause a spark, um, we're not going to have it spread throughout the landscape. Uh, make sure that we protect our water quality. And then also um, in some of these zones, we need to take a look at some of the fallen uh, materials that are in. Now, like I talked about, there is a lot of different resources when it comes to um, fire smart landscaping or fire wise landscaping. 
Um, we've got some of the links on the screen. I'm sure we'll share them out with you later for those of you that are doing the recording. Um, but the Nebraska Forest Service has a living with fire document. It's a 16 page document. It's extensive. It hits upon all of the, the aspects that we talked about today. Also Colorado State has another um, great publication, very extensive. And like I talked about, we've got lots of other ones on here. So I mean, um, fire resistant plants has a more extensive list for you. And then also uh, FireWise checklist. So there's lots of opportunities to, for further education about these different items. Um, so with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your comments, Mary, and thanks, Elizabeth. Any questions for Elizabeth before we dive into the next one? Okay. If not, I guess it's my turn. So I will share my screen. 